listeners we're back for another episode of the bbcom podcast and today we are joined by dr dan giordano dan is a doctor of physical therapy certified strength and conditioning specialist and co-founder of bespoke treatments a sport and orthopedic rehab clinic with locations in new york city san diego and seattle dan we are excited to have you on the bbcom podcast today i think we have a great convo prepared for all the listeners out there Thank you for having me. I'm super pumped to talk to you and try to help listeners out there and give some knowledge about the rehab industry. Yeah, before we get into it, I do have to say we have just signed Bespoke to an annual partnership here at Bodybuilding.com. We'll be bringing all of our BodyFit users with preventative exercise care, movement prep, all the way to core recovery for postpartum parents. So look out for those programs releasing once per month for the rest of 2023, and you'll get to know a little bit of everybody from the Bespoke team across the country. Nice. Let's dive into it, Dan. So tell us a little bit about yourself. What prompted you to get into the sports medicine field? Take us back to day one, where you started, and and how'd you get to where you are today? All right, so day one, okay. So uh, my interest in physio came from an injury, right? So I was a uh, promising high school athlete uh, looking to play Division I sport level. Um, Got injured my senior year, and it actually prevented me from playing football in college, right? So that actually led me to going through physio and really taking the physio into my own hands and really educating myself using the use of bodybuilding.com back then, which is wild that it comes full circle, um, and other magazines and such to learn about strength conditioning. And then what happened when I got to college, uh, I started, you know, I kind of had that itch of why am I not playing a sport at that level? And I injured my shoulder and I made it a goal of mine that I'm gonna walk onto a team so then I wound up walking on to the wrestling team, um, which was wild because I didn't wrestle in high school. And then I walked on to Division One wrestling team. So it was a very humbling experience because uh, I didn't even know the rules, which is wild. I remember my first match was actually at a uh, Brown University. And I didn't know the score because I didn't know how to keep points. My coach was just like to yelling at me, telling me what to do just to make sure I didn't get pinned so for the team, right, for points. And it was uh, it wound up being a very humbling experience. Uh, but then I learned so much about rehab because I was kind of like at the end point of my rehab and I really got to learn more about anatomy and from there I decided, you know, I'm going to go to grad school and get my doctorate in physical therapy and that's what really kind of pushed me forward to that. Um, and then I went to NYU, New York University, got my doctorate there and started to work in physical therapy, um, started to learn more about athletes, started working with uh, medical teams for like USA Track and Field, the World Championships, IAF got me into some like CrossFit World Championships and then working with um, Nike Elite Basketball Leagues. Um, and that's when we started Bespoke, right? So we started Bespoke to try to basically improve the quality of care. So we saw a lot of problems with the industry. And then when we came together, we started Bespoke, me and my business partner. And now we've developed a great team um, and we're really trying to just change that quality of care so people actually know what physical therapy is and how it can be useful for anyone in the industry or anyone just training or health-wise. So, you know, that's what Bespoke is, and now we're in three different cities, and we're really just trying to push it to the next level so physical therapy as a whole improves. Bespoke treatments is not your ordinary uh, physio experience. Tell us how you differ from the traditional physical therapy experience, not only for, for sport patients, but for all patients who come through your doors. Yeah, so we work with everyone from everyday athletes um, to, you know, Olympic level athletes, pro athletes, CEOs, all different types of people. We're really just working with people that are trying to better themselves. So our treatments are what we say research driven and tech enabled. We use a lot of technology, which is very different from the physio field, right? So we use a lot of technology because what we do is we start to gather data. And if we can gather data, we really get to learn about our patients. And from there, we can develop hypotheses, right? So we can retest our hypotheses, change our hypotheses. And that in turn will allow the patient to get better faster. Um, And one of the biggest things that we do is we work with the individual, not just on the acute injuries, but also on the longevity aspect of it, right? So if you come to us with an injury, we're gonna help you get out of that pain, but then also look at you as the individual as the whole and see how we can help your performance. Um, And that's great because we've been able to really help people prolong their healthy lifestyles and improve their performance, which as you know, if you improve your performance in the gym or in your body physiologically, it can help you everything from mental to your work. Um, And we just see people improve. So we're really helping people. And that's been the best thing about what we do is we see people change and improve their overall quality of life, which is 
I mean, it just makes us feel so great. And as a team, as a whole, we have a we have an awesome team. Honestly, um, our team is great, and our team really comes together to help each other. So that's one of the biggest things that we do, and we all work together so that we all learn from each other, right? And if we all learn from each other, we can improve together and improve as a whole. Tell us a little bit about that testing. Tell us, you know, how you dictate which testing you're going to conduct for that patient. Is it every test under the sun that you do once they come in as a new patient? And tell us how this information not only helps you as their provider, tell us the valuable information that gives someone as a patient to take home with them and apply to their daily health and wellness. Yeah, so um, in the medical field, basically there's subjective testing and then there's special tests that you do to diagnose injuries, right, and create prognoses. So we're diagnosing injuries using what we learned in school um, and using subjective testing to see how patients feel, to really understand how the patient feels from their side of it. But then what we do is a lot of objective testing, right? So our objective testing allows us to gather data, like we said. These tests can consist of force testing, metabolic testing, or motion analysis. Everyone, when they come through our door, gets some sort of motion analysis and force testing so that we can really evaluate the entire body as a whole physiologically. And then if they want to improve on certain things, like if they're an endurance athlete or someone who wants to work on their heart health, we'll put them through a metabolic test. And with those metabolic tests, we can get some information that can help apply to their training programs or to their rehab program. So we're really just gathering all sorts of information that is measurable, not just subjective, objective data. And we pull it together then to create our hypothesis um, and then create the programs from there to see how we can improve. And the best part about having objective data is that if things aren't working or you know they're only getting better to a point or they're 90% better, we can go back to that data and then look at it again and see if we missed anything. Um, and because we have that objective and measurable data, we can see where there's falls or fail, fail, failures. And then we can change it and change the program to help them get that extra 10% or that last 10% remaining in their rehab. Tell us how the level of the tests that you're performing at your facility differ than maybe what people can get uh, somewhere else, right? There's there's many different types of VO2 tests, for example, mm-hmm. right? But tell us about the one that you do and how that maybe differs from maybe just your standard Bruce protocol. So kind of break down the differences of kind of what your generic forms of these tests are, but then really how you guys get granular with what you're doing at Bespoke. So for the VO2 and RMR, we'll go into that, um, but we use Panoe. Um, Panoe is a gold standard VO2 max testing in RMR. So they'll take all the data and on the back end they'll evaluate that data and then send us a report and then we'll then break down that report with that individual to see where we see differences or our team and our experts um, Cameron Ewan leads that and Sam Chan and what they do is they really break down everything and then work with the individual to find what they can improve on or what gathered that data that was collected and how it calculated and see where there's issues right also we work with Vald Performance. Vald Performance is a force testing company um, and the same thing. So it's measured by newtons and it can measure the amount of force that someone is producing and it can measure median force and peak force. So we can actually see, because a lot of the times when you're measuring just force like over two seconds, everyone looks good, right? But then there's a failure that occurs at four seconds. So if we can see these on graphs, we can see where the failure is coming from or if it's an endurance failure or just a strength for a force production, right? We also use um, force plates to see when people are jumping, how they're jumping, if they're pushing off one side versus another, that's also the VOLD. And then motion analysis, we work with a company called Kinotech. Kinotech um, uses a 3D visualization through a Microsoft uh, Kinect, I think it's called, camera. Um, and that uses motion analysis to then to see how the individual is moving. So it measures range of motion, but then it also gives us an avatar. And if we could see that avatar, we can you know slow down, move forward, zoom in, and you could see where failures are actually occurring. So it's really cool technology. We're hoping that this technology becomes more accepted in the medical field um, so that the medical field becomes more objective and measurements so that we can actually see things rather than just subjectively, which the medical field has been for 100 plus years. Uh, it's all subjective data, so if we can use this and hopefully more people can start to adapt this and then we can improve the industry as a whole um, as we start to grow too as well. Yeah, and someone doesn't necessarily have to come in with an injury to get this done, right? Someone could purely be curious, where are my imbalances living? How can I perform as better as an athlete despite whatever sport or modality that I'm chasing after? So tell people the importance of just kind of having this data, you know, injury aside, maybe you're not injured yet, but tell us how this information can apply to you preventing injuries or let's say lowering the risk of injury for future cases. Yeah, absolutely. So it's very interesting. A lot of people actually don't come to us originally with an injury. 
So people find us because they have injuries or they've been injured in the past, um, and that's how when they come to us, they find out that we do more than just treat injuries, right? And that recreates just an organic referral source where people start coming in um, and wanting to do testing and objective data, right? So when we do this testing, especially with, um, let's say, Vald, let's use Vald as an example. So the force testing, human bodies are not symmetrical. We know that, like, you know, there's a big argument about that. Like, everyone's like, oh, you're not symmetrical. Yeah, I understand. But if you're showing a 20% deficit from left to right, you know something's going on, right? And if you have that issue where you have a deficit on, let's use your glute, 20% deficit on your right side, over a period of time, your left side is going to be overloaded, right? So then your right side can, you know, have an issue for this prolonged period, or your left side can be overloaded, and, you know, what's the cause of most injuries is overload or increase in volume or an increase in intensity. And that left side can create an injury, you know, after X amount of time. So um, let's use, I have actually someone, let's use someone for an example. So I have someone who just had a total knee replacement. And years ago, he told me that um, my left side is just, you know, he was a high jumper in college, a division one high jumper. And he's in his 50s, late 50s. He's like, my right side has just been beat up my entire life, my entire life, my entire life. And then we look at, you know, the data now for the, about a year ago, we started using force analysis data. And we see that there's a huge difference from side to side. Sure enough, like, you know, six, eight months go by and they look at his joint through imaging and it's completely degenerated. And it just shows that that side has been compensating. And yes, that was a stronger side for his entire life, but most likely because he's been compensating his entire life. So there's, you know, there's that up and down of symmetrical versus asymmetrical, um, but we're really just gathering all this data to create a hypothesis to help people. So preventively, we can see where failures are and start to work on that so that it can hopefully reduce the risk of injury in the future or help them prevent from getting the surgeries and really just work to rehab and, you know, avoid those surgeries or avoid going over the knife. So, Talk a little bit about VO2 testing. Okay. What, what information can that give someone how can they then go on to improve their heart health and their cardiovascular health after receiving a test like that and why do we test vo2 what is that actually doing just educating people at home what this test is mm -hmm. so vo2 max uh, measures the amount of oxygen you can consume during exercise and how efficiently you can actually use it right so during the test you go through um, stages of exercise where they, we increase the intensity during the exercise and we have that measurable data of how you're consuming that oxygen how you're using it efficiently during that as well, we measure your heart rate. So when we get the calculations after and the data after, it shows you where you are with your heart rate at certain peaks in your VO2 during the course of that exercise intensity. From that, the calculations show us um, basically your RQ, which is, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm talking about RMR. So basically what happens is when you pull that data, it shows you your level of your heart rate um, during different training zones. So you have five training zones, five heart rate training zones, right? Zone one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, zone one is like 50 to 60 percent of your heart rate and zone two 60 to 70 70 80 80 90 greater than 90 right and then it'll show us what your exact zones are so for you, you let's say your zone one you want to work on fat burn that would be your zone one so it'll tell you the exact gold standard numbers of you need to be between this heart rate and this so x and y right zone two same thing it gives you that nice you know breakdown of whether it's 110 to 120 heart rate bpms it's showing you where you need to be for your endurance. So zone two would be in endurance or increase in cardio output. Um, zone three would be kind of that middle feature. So that middle man that would just have that VO2 max increase. Zone four, which is higher intensity, is more anaerobic. So if you improve your anaerobic. Um, and then zone five is max. So for zone five, not a lot of people get to. It's more for power output and max. And a lot of elite at level athletes get there because your heart rate's so high. So you're using that VO2 max. You're seeing how you consume oxygen, how you use it efficiently. And then it's giving you gold standard data of what heart rate zones you need to be in to start working those different systems. So it's a great way for endurance athletes or everyday athletes just to work on what they need to work on. So if you're like for me, for instance, I'm terrible at zone two training. Um, I was a sprinter, you know, growing up, I played sports like football and wrestled at very high intensity for short periods of time. So I have a really hard time working in that zone two. Sure enough, I take my VO2 max and my zone two is terrible. So I need to do low intensity cardio output work to improve my cardiovascular system so that my cardio output improves. And as a whole, as an athlete, I improve. Um, Cause we don't do that, right? You don't really see exactly what numbers you need to be in using gold standard heart rate training data. Right, and just to show how vastly different two people can be. I mean, I, I've had my test done at Bespoke as well. And, and as a triathlete, I, I was, 
doing tons and tons of that zone one, zone two work, right? For me, I get zero zone five. So for me, my report was you need to go get some zone five in your life and you need to start maxing out and getting to the, you know that 190, 195 heart rate a little bit more. So it's really great just to see the differences and just to, you know, across the board, it isn't just as simple as looking at a chart and applying that to everybody. Every body is different and testing can help establish where you need to be. Yeah, that's, and so I, I, men I mentioned RQ, um, respiratory, um, uh, I can't say, I can never say it right, um, quotient. So it's basically your, that's from the RMR test, so the resting metabolic rate test. And the resting metabolic rate test is what you do when you're just sitting at rest. So it just sees how your body's working at rest. That's a great thing also to test for all you listeners out there. It really shows how efficiently you're working and really it measures your, you know, oxygen consumption versus your carbon dioxide output. Um, and then it shows you what you're burning, whether you're fat, carbs, or both. Um, and then it shows you a number of where you should be for certain and what you should work on. So if you're consuming so many carbohydrates versus fat, it'll give you some numbers on that. I think it's like 0.7 and below is fat. Uh, greater than one is carb, or in between is that 0.7 to one. And as we're at rest, we usually use fat as a storage. But if you have someone who has some issues and you're like diabetes or something, and you're consuming too many carbohydrates or burning that, it's a way that you can actually kind of manipulate or change the diet slightly to modify it to improve you as a whole. So I always recommend doing the RMR plus the uh, VO2 together at once. That's probably the, the most interesting piece that I think came out of my test as well, especially for endurance athletes out there. It can kind of show you how often you need to fuel based off of what heart rate or what zone that you're living in. So for me, it made total sense that Cameron, shout out to Cameron at Bespoke, um, I was burning through glucose at a very fast level. So to me, I'm under fueling almost for a lot of these, these, these races that I'm doing, which makes sense because I, I am hitting periods of kind of, they call it bonking, right? So mm -hmm. for me, I need to make sure I'm keeping my glucose level because I burn through my glucose very quickly and I'm burning through my, <clears throat> excuse me, my carbs very quickly as well, whereas I'm not actually getting to that fat burning um, stage. So that's something I'm working on right now in the off season, just zone two fat burning to kind of manipulate my body so that when my re next race comes up, I'm not ripping through my carbs and my glucose as quickly. Exactly, and then you'll save some energy for that race so you'll improve as a whole. So if you just did that to change during your training, when you get to that race day, you'll be able to work more efficiently, right? So you'll save energy during your race and you know that will, in theory, improve your race. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's segue into types of injuries. Um, let's talk about you know t most common injuries that you're seeing maybe in the sport of bodybuilding versus the sport of running versus the sport of a hybrid CrossFit athlete who probably has a little bit of everything going on when they walk through your door. So let's break that down by sport and modality. So we'll start with bodybuilding, right? Um, most people that are weightlifters or looking for strongman competitions, things like that, uh, we're lifting very heavy. They usually come to me with low back pain. That's like the number one thing that occurs. Uh, low back pain, knee tendonitis, or even just some strains and sprains. So running is a little different. Running, it'll be more low extremity injuries, um, which can even go to like stress fractures, things like that, or shin splints, or Achilles problems, or plantar fasciitis, right? And then that hybrid athlete, that CrossFit athlete, is kind of a combination of both, right? Because they're Metcons and the metabolic condition days and things that they're doing. Um, so it's a real mix of injuries. The weightlifter or bodybuilding type athlete um, usually comes to us with some sort of pains or strains in the lower back, and it's usually just because they're increasing volume or intensity too hard. That's kind of the same across all sports. Usually if you increase your volume, your intensity, or if you're running, increase your speed or your volume, the amount of mileage that you're doing just too fast, your body doesn't adapt properly. So you always have to give yourself time to adapt. So a gradual increase is always the way to go. Um, it's the same thing when you're, you know, when you're lifting, if you're not warming up properly and you're just throwing the weight or like, oh, I can do a little more, I can do 50 pounds more, maybe go for like a 20 pound increase first or a 10 pound increase and just gradually get your weight up to that because if you increase your load or your volume too fast, you're kind of just not allowing your body to adapt and you're asking for trouble, which creates injury, right? So if you gradually increase, whether you're a runner, a bodybuilder or a CrossFit athlete, you'll probably help yourself in the long term by not putting too much stress on your body, right? Your body's stressed enough when it works out. If you increase the stress levels too high, there's a strong probability you're gonna to start to injure yourself. So just be careful and just gradually increase as you get there. Talk about types of injury in terms of overuse injuries and things like soft tissue versus skeletal. <clears throat> kind of break those down for people at home who aren't familiar and also kind of how can someone at home uh, dictate kind of what's going on with their own body when they are experiencing pain? So does, what does the sharp pain go with? What does the dull pain go with? That, those type of, of breakdowns. Okay, so that's interesting. So there's a difference between being hurt and being injured, I always say, right? 
Um, so let's, 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 let's say being hurt, okay? So if we start with being hurt per se, being hurt's not really being injured. Let's differentiate those two things. Uh, being hurt could just be soreness, um, straining the tissues, or just kind of being super fatigued, right? Usually being hurt is not a heavy amount of pain. It's pain that goes away with some sort of self-care, whether that's icing, heating, stretching, using a foam roller or a massage gun. If you can just use that and use some passive modalities that's out there these days and you feel better, you're probably just tired or fatigued and you need a little rest, right? Injured, being injured is totally different. Being injured means there is some sort of injury to your soft tissue. So your soft tissue is damaged, okay? Um, and if your soft tissue is damaged, per se, you have injuries that don't go away with self-care, okay? The pain also is usually very different. When you have an injury, the pain could be very sharp or very intense. Whereas when you're hurt, it's just kind of like a dull or an ache that's occurring. If the pain's sharp, the pain's intense, or it creates loss of range of motion, like your joint range of motion actually decreases, could be from inflammation or it could be some damage in the joint itself. But if you lose joint range of motion, you'll lose functional ability to do daily activities of daily living or things that you normally do without any issue. If that is the case, you have to seek help from a medical professional. Because if you prolong this and you don't attack that injury right away, this can lead to more damage or damage that requires you to get different types of medical treatment. And like we say, we, the worst thing could be some sort of surgery. So if you have a pain that's under a four, under a three, kind of tired, fatigued, self-care usually helps, great, you just hurt, right? Take some rest, work on it. And by rest, I don't mean completely shut down. We'll put that out there. Move, moving is usually the best, right? Motion, but pain-free range of motion or low levels of pain range of motion. Get on the bike, walk, do your thing. Don't just lay in bed. That's not been shown ever to help people. Um, but if you're really having that sharp, intense pain or shooting pains or pains that are causing you to you know, avoid or modify your daily activities, then seek medical help because you wanna make sure that you get that in the beginning of that acute phase before it turns into something else that's too intense. So it's fair to say, you know, go for more of that low pack, low impact movement, you know, until you start to figure out what things are going on. But why is maintaining that blood flow so important for something to to not totally shut it down? Well, because blood carries oxygen, right? And if blood and oxygen come together, it'll help the tissue heal itself. So that's the main concept of that's the main concept of physical therapy is like how do we get blood and oxygen back to the tissue so the body starts to do a thing and heal itself. And that's that motion. Motion is lotion, right? So the more you move, the more you increase your circulation and the better you'll feel. If you're just shutting down, that's not good because you're not moving, one, so you're decreasing circulation. You can cause pooling or inflammation to hit certain areas, and then you're going to create more harm than good, and it could lead to an array of problems. So move, circulate, increase blood flow as much as you can. Um, and that's why all these modalities that are out there, right, all these passive modalities that we have access to now that you and I didn't have access to when we were college athletes, right? Our, uh, our treatment, I should laugh, our treatment no, was it's, like it's whirlpool we had a foam roller. and ice. That's not it. I didn't have foam roller. I had a PVC <laughs> pipe at my university, right? So, and that hurt. And that was also foam rolling shouldn't hurt, putting that out there, okay? It's self-massage, just be easy on it. PVC pipe could be too intense for a lot of people. So uh, we didn't have this stuff. And now there's modalities out there that, yeah, they're passive, but their main concept of the majority of these modalities are to increase blood flow. And if we can increase blood flow to the area, it's just gonna speed up our recovery process. These aren't the things that are gonna fully heal us, but it'll help. So it's like a tool that can help us speed up the process so that we're not just sitting there and resting, like bed rest that was recommended back in the day to everyone, not just you know sedentary individuals. This was recommended to athletes for a long period of time. So just get moving, offload a little bit. Um, if you're like, you know, you can't you have pain walking, but you don't have pain on the bike, use the bike, things like that. So just offload a bit, increase blood flow, rest, hydrate, eat well, sleep well. Um, those are the key factors. A lot of people forget about all those other factors, but you have to sleep, that's how your body recovers. You have to hydrate, that's how your body gets, you know, more blood to the uh, circulation, to the tissues, to your joints. And you have to eat well, because if you're eating poorly, you're gonna increase chronic inflammation in your body. And then if you have too much inflammation in your body, your body's not gonna adapt and not gonna recover faster. So 
this all comes, this is all, everything comes together, so many external factors. Yeah, so finding that middle ground between full stop, full rest, and then the mindset of no pain, no gain. <laughs> so, yeah, you get it. Yeah, so. old school mentality. And I think, I think there is an industry shift happening now, and I think, um, to your point, you know, collegiate athletes are in a much, much better spot than even five, ten years ago at this point. I mean, they're, they're getting access. And you, ha- you have mid-major schools now. They have nutritionists. They have, you know, dedicated strength and conditioning coaches. They have the resources that a lot of, you know, athletes prior did not. So um, it's great to see that shift. And it's also just great to see that shift in the general health and wellness industry now. You know, people using hot and cold therapy more, people doing, you know, at home massages, whether that's with a gun or Mm -hmm. even the self myofascial release, things of that nature. You said something interesting, and we might have to go into the foam rolling. So why foam rolling? Why should foam rolling not hurt? What areas should you avoid when you're foam rolling? How can we foam roll with, um, you know, other tools, not just the roller itself, but peanuts and balls and Mm -hmm. the intensity of the ball so you can use could dive into that a little bit and break it down by the areas of the body so foam rolling is just a form of self myofascial release um do we need more research on it 100 percent, but it is a massage right so the main concept of it is to increase blood flow to the area um, and to try to relax the tissue itself you don't want to hurt yourself okay so with anything just like getting a really tough massage if you if the masseuse goes too hard on you you're bruising your tissue so you're slowing down the recovery process right so a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I, I put more body weight on the area. It hurts so good. Nah, it'd be a little easy on that, right? Offload your body weight because you want it to just be a massage to be what it's used for, to increase blood flow to the area and decrease some tension to modulate pain, right? And that will then allow you to get into your rehab or your exercise and you do the strength in the tissue long term. Um, with the foam roller, per se, a lot of people ask me about vibration. Um, do we know what it's exactly doing? No, and not when you necessarily. say vibration, you're talking about, let's say, massage guns, right? Well, I'm actually talking or about a vibrating, vibrating foam, foam roller. roller. Yeah. That's right. So everyone's like, do I get a vibrating <laughs> one? And we don't know. You know, I, I use the vibrating one. We actually did a study at Bespoke uh, using um, our biometric device, the Biostrap, and we used the uh, TheraBody foam roller, which is called the Wave, which I love. It's a great foam roller. Um, and we just did a, you know, a quick study with 20 people. So it's not really, you know, it's a great study, but we're using a case study, 20 people. And we checked to see if it helped improve our sleep, thinking it would, right? So, because it massages the area, relaxation. Well, it didn't improve our sleep. It did the complete opposite. And we think, talking to uh, the team over, Tim Roberts over at Therabody, is that it possibly was due to the vibration or the change of movement in your body positioning. And so we don't really know, right? We do know that it increases, most likely increases blood flow and it acts as self-massage. So if you have some soft tissue restrictions or you're feeling tight in certain areas, it's a good tool to use, like using a massage gun as well, right? So it's a self-massage the area to decrease some tissue restrictions, improve blood flow, relax the tissue most likely with certain things or with the vibrating one in case it did the opposite. It actually, oddly enough, so we tested a reactive strength index so the way we jump and you know, time on the floor and how we react. And when we use the vibrating foam roller prior, it improved our RSI, so reactive strength index. So it did the opposite we were thinking, but it just kind of shows that we need more research. And that's where we are in 2023 is now we have all this technology and we're learning more about it and we're getting more research. But people forget science isn't black and white, it's gray. So maybe what we're talking about right now, maybe a year from now we have another podcast and we're like, yo, Foam rolling does the opposite of what we thought it did. So use it for what it is. Just keep an open mind. Um, you know, don't get tunnel vision on these things because it is science and we're learning more and more as we go now. Yeah, you made a great point. I mean, with the emergence of all of these tools and, and then, you know, obviously comes most likely the data to follow, unfortunately, right? Yeah. So a cool new shiny toy comes out, everybody runs out and gets it, but we're not entirely educated on how we should be using it, when we should be using it. What is in in your um, in your head, what is the ideal kind of use case for these tools? Should I be foam rolling before I'm working out? Should I be more static stretching, dynamic stretching? What is the order of events when it comes to um, stretching and foam rolling and recovery modalities, kind of when when should I be doing them? How does it impact based off of the activity that I'm about to set out on, whether that's running or, or a weightlifting session? Kind of break that down a little bit for us. Okay, so um, we'll talk about how to warm up, right? But let's 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 touch if you have a soft tissue restriction or tightness or you're recovering from an injury or something like that. Um, I always like to use that foam roller or massage gun to just loosen the tissue, um, just self-massage the area. 
don't crush yourself, right? You just want to, for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute on an area, just try to release any tissue restrictions that you're feeling in the area, have that self-massage before you get into your warm-up. Um, when you're getting into your warm-up, I like to use the RAMP. I don't know if you've heard of RAMP, R-A-M-P. So it stands for uh, Raise, Activate, Mobilize, Potentiate. So what you're doing is you're raising your heart rate, okay? Um, whether that's via jumping jacks, walking, biking, jogging, anything. Just increase your heart rate, uh, get your body moving, get your body ready to go. Activate, you know, add in a couple body weight squats, lunges, or push-ups, right? Upper body, lower body, what you're doing, just to try to just activate your tissues a little bit. And then you go to mobilize. So that's when the dynamic stretching comes into play. So dynamic stretching, I like to dynamic stretch prior to activity. So it's an active stretch or dynamic stretch, kind of moving the joint through the full range of motion, having active stretch on the tissue, just to activate tissue, increase blood flow circulation, and to really get your body starting to warm up. And then potentiate means the sport specific activity. So if you follow that ramp protocol, and that could be jumping, sprinting, or striding, you know, if a running warm up would go into strides prior to a run, um, just very sport specific type movements itself. But if you use that ramp, it's a great way to hopefully reduce your risk of injury, but really just prepare your body for the activity or the sport that you're doing. Um, and then I like to, like I said before, just use the soft tissue restriction stuff prior um, to get your body into it. Or if you're feeling like super tight, maybe use the raise, you know, whether that's walking, just to increase blood flow, and then, you know, substitute that soft tissue modality right in between before you get into the R, the AMP aspect of it. So um, just move that way. Passive modalities, usually for recovery, um, whether you're gonna use the boots, the compression boots, which are great, red light therapy, infrared sauna, cold, hot kind of contrast, use it after. There's a place and time for everything. You know, sometimes a lot of these past modalities get a bad rep in a way because people say, oh, it's not gonna help. No, it's not gonna help cure an injury, but use it where it needs to be used, right? Use it for what it's good for. It's not gonna, you can't use it for everything. It's not gonna make you feel better or cure your injury, but you know, let's, we can use any of these. Let's say intermittent mag, compression boots, compression boots. Um, increase blood flow, you know, compress and release, so increases blood flow, drain your lymphatic system, and just help pump, right? There's also some research that shows it releases IGF-1 growth factor, which is um, basically a growth factor come from a liver that helps tissue repair itself. So there's all different ways these, what these things do, but the real thing is we have to educate ourselves on all of them. You know, talk to someone in the field or someone that does research on these or read your own research, is new coming out all the time. Um, just read about it and understand where you incorporate it into your recovery or into your training. So it's used for what exactly it's used for, what the research shows it's been helpful for. Really, no matter how much, let's say, prehab, rehab, et cetera, and how many, no matter how many preventative measures you do take, injuries do happen, right? Whether you're kind of just a weekend warrior, an everyday gym goer, all the way up to the highest level performing athletes. Injuries happen, small, minor, it's just a part of life. Take us through kind of your gold standard um, process when someone comes in with a new injury and, and tell us where you start and tell us about the manual processes that you put into place all the way to how strength training also plays a part in that recovery process. Okay, so um, let's use for someone comes in. As a healthcare professional and as a practitioner, the number one thing we should do is listen. Um, ask as many questions as you can. One of the best things that about Bespoke is that we have one-on-one -on -one treatment. There's no assistance aides, trainers there, it's just one-on-one -on -one with your doctor, physical therapy. And we also have private treatment rooms. So we don't have tables out in the open so people can't hear what other people are saying. Um, those private treatments allow us to really ask questions. You'd be shocked at how much we learn from asking questions. Who, what, when, where, right? How did the injury occur? When? What happened? What do you feel? Um, explain it. And over periods of time, spending more time with patients, you could be you know, day one, you could have X and Y, and then on day three, they're like, oh, actually, this is what happened, or this is what I feel. And that can really determine what's happening or the diagnoses or prognoses, right? So as a healthcare professional, the number one thing we can do is listen, um, and really listen to the individual and talk to the individual, because the more we know about what's going on, the more we know how we can help, or exactly how or what this injury is, because we're not always right, you know? That's a hard thing that a lot of people have is they, they can't accept that they don't know, right? And if you don't know, you don't know. It's pretty standard. Like, you can't, you're not all of a sudden gonna be like, oh, actually, it's this. That does happen, don't get me wrong, but sometimes you're like, I don't know what's going on. 
And that's when I either refer them to one of my colleagues that spoke or refer them out to an orthopedic doctor for something or, you know, sometimes we have to refer for imaging so we can actually know what's going on. I know you're not your MRI, but sometimes to actually figure out what's happening, we need to see what the underlying cause is, right? So number one thing is listen. Listen, ask as many questions as we can, and then we have our assessment where we go into the force metabolic emotion testing. Um, once we get the data from there, we can see what's going on. And visually, obviously, with the motion testing, you can see where restrictions are and they can determine it. Once we find out or what we believe our hypothesis is, then we can go in to see if there's any tissue restrictions. So we could do manual therapy to help modulate pain or really just have that therapeutic effect so that we can improve range of motion or decrease restrictions using manual therapy, right, which then will allow us to get into strength training. Um, and that's how we stabilize our tissue long term, is that you mobilize the tissue, uh, you increase blood flow and circulation to the area, and then you stabilize it through the full range of motion so that the tissue adapts and understands that full range of motion, right? If you're just doing stretching, I don't recommend just doing one. You have to combo everything together. If you're just doing one versus the other, you're really not getting that full effect of your muscles to adapt to create that change, right, so that we can become better and our muscles can become better. That's how we grow. And then Obviously, strength training is progressive load, um, progress through that load or increase load and volume over time so you get stronger. And then after, most likely, let's say we did um, manual therapy, we did our strength training, and then there's a recovery process. And that's where those passive modalities come in so that if we could help increase the therapeutic effect or increasing blood flow to the area post, it can help your body recover faster or just improve your recovery time overall. And that's when that all comes to play. And that's when all those modalities come back into play. And like we said, you're not using all the same modalities and everything. You painted a really nice picture of, of the process, really, and, and how you bring it full circle. So it really starts with that manual therapy. You go into that strength reinforcing, and then it's about recovery. Let's break those three down a little bit. Um, pick an injury, right? Pick, mm -hmm. a, pick an injury and tell us how you would approach it in each of those three stages. So let's start with that, that manual manipulation that you typically start out with a patient and how you apply that and different tools that you can use. Stim was one of them. What else are you using in your toolkit? Okay, I'm going to um, I'm gonna use some example, and she's going to hate me for saying this, but I'm I'm gonna use Kristen as an example. Kristen's one of our physios over at Bespoke that you know, and Kristen is a power lifter and she's super fit. And very recently she hurt her back, right? She knows what she's doing, but she lifted very heavy and it happened and she's dealing with a strain right now. So, you know, we work together as we do as a team. Well, if someone is hurt, we're gonna use each other, right, for physio. So she's having a lower back issue and what we'll do is we'll start with some manual work or some joint manipulations and mobilization. So we didn't talk about this. So. What we'll do is, because she has a low back injury, we want to assess the area above and below as well. So not just the lower back. You want to go with the hips and the thoracic spine, right? So with her, we'll do some joint mobilizations. We're using an SI joint belt, and I'm really distracting the joint and moving the joint through the range of motion so that we can restore the proper range of motion of our hips so that it can take pressure off of her lower back properly, right? Also, we're using STEM on her lower back and her glutes to try to increase more blood flow to the area to relax the tissue, right? So we'll go through that manual process for that lower back. Um, and then after we get through that manual work, and you know, we use instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization as well, or Graston, to try to increase blood flow. So there's some research out of um, the Journal of Body Work and something else, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on that, but there's some research on grass and instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization that shows a localized increase in blood flow um, and increase in fibroblast activity or the increase in collagen uh, production, which helps you know muscle repair and reform to the area. So, break down what is grassing for those who don't know at home. So it's instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. Um, what it is is those tools that you see people scraping themselves with, um, and what it is shown to do is just localized blood flow, like we said in circulation. More blood flow to the area can help. Some research in mice, I believe, that increases fibroblast activity, which goes in to repair our fibers. But we do know increases collagen synthesis and, and basically collagen production, which helps muscle repair, right, and remodelization of collagen, so muscle. So we know that it can help. So if anything we can do, we're using these tools with what we know they do to improve blood flow and circulation, common with other forms of manual therapy. And then with her, it could go right into a mobility program, right? So we'll go into a mobility program. We're working to mobilize the hips, the thoracic spine as well, because the lower back, you got to look above and below. And then we'll go into strength, right? Um, with her, we've realized that she has a decrease in strength and end range of motion on external rotation of her hips, right? So think, um, think like a clamshell activity lying on your side, you lift the leg up all the way. She actually has an issue with that end range. So what we're trying to do is stabilize in that end range, and by doing that, she's getting pressure off her lower back, 
And we realize that that may be what the issue is, is our external rotators are very weak all the way at that end range positioning, right? And as you think about when you're going to your deadlifts or certain types of squats or movements, sometimes that external rotation, your feet are turned out, right? So we have to make sure that she's strength strong through those entire ranges so that there's no compensation on her lower back and she's just stabilizing through. So, you know, for it's with different with every injury, obviously. Um, but you want to use all of these things together into one and then remember to strengthen throughout the entire range of motion. Um, you know, there's a time and place for like time under tension or pulsing to get more activation, but you want to make sure that you're really strengthening through the entire range. The tissue adapts to that range of motion over periods of time and becomes stronger. Is it fair to say that you're essentially retraining that area of the body once you kind of get it calmed down, once you get some blood flow in there and we're kind of almost reprogramming it maybe is a better way to put it, yeah. um, of how it should be operating on a daily basis when it's, get, when it's out of that inflammation and kind of that, that gripping phase, right? Yeah, you're adapting. So your body, your body's resilient, first off. Our, our bodies are super resilient and we want to adapt. So whether we you know, put stress on that tissue or we stress in different ways, your body needs to adapt to it. It's just like anything. The, the, we, there's good types of stress and bad types of stress, right? And those good types of stress are allow our bodies to adapt and become stronger, whether that's mentally or physiologically. It's just adaptation. And when we learn these stresses and improve on these stresses, our body is just going to become better and more resilient. So that's exactly what we're doing is we're just stressing the tissue and making it more resilient and stronger and adapting. Um, and then over periods of time, the tissue will become hypertrophy or stronger and just more resilient to basically protect your body on everything else and hopefully reduce your risk of injuries in the future. And what's the importance of that recovery stage? So why why do you not typically allow a patient to say, okay, I did my manual, I did my, my strength, but I got to head out of here. You're like, no, 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 I need you to stim for 20 minutes. What's what's the benefit of that? So for us, it's after our treatment, right? So it's time that's separate. A lot of people are like, oh, don't put that part of your treatment. No, no, we're not charging people for this. So basically what we're trying to do is just create that therapeutic effect so that the patient has more blood flow to the area that they can do on their own. So we spend our 60 minutes with them and then if they have 20 minutes or 30 minutes and we have time as well to set them up, we'll put them on because it's just a passive modality. One, you almost like a cool down, right? So you can't skip your cool down. So if you just go from training hard in physio, and we do train hard at Bespoke, we're not just a physio that you sweat, you're going to work. I can attest for those. Yeah. <laughs> like we work hard there. So it's not what you, maybe some listeners think is like, oh, physio. No, we're working hard. We're, we're performance training. We're training hard. We're getting people back to where they need to be. Um, and afterwards, you need to cool down. So you need to, a part of, a, basically let's say a cool down. A cool down is your body's going to retain, uh, go back to your pre-workout phase. So whether that's you know, decreased heart rate, decreased body temperature, you need to bring yourself back down. If you just stop and you, basically your blood pressure will drop and you can faint or get dizzy, right? And then your body won't get the proper, um, basically recovery aspect. So you're going to be more strained, more susceptible to strains or strains or sprains or strains and such like that. So we need to cool the body down, let the body adapt and relax. Using these passive modalities can help increase blood flow to the area to increase the therapeutic effect to just enhance that recovery process. So if you have 20 minutes at the end of your session, we'll either put you on boots, stim, red light, infrared sauna, just anything that is particular to that injury that can help that patient relax their body, decrease stress, before they go back to work, right? So we're in New York City and as you know, patients will, they have 68 minutes, right? They'll come in, they're like, I've eight minutes remaining before they need to run to the next meeting and get in the next call. And if there's anything we can do to help them, you know, prolong that therapeutic effect or increase blood flow and relax the tissue, relax the mind, they're gonna perform better. They're also gonna go back to work with a better sense and they're gonna be clear in their mind, right? So, because if you're caught up on things like stress, it can affect everything from the way you're reacting, how you're thinking, your coordination, your everything can be affected by stress. So if we can relax the body and the individual, it help them recover faster. And we've done our job as well. So they're recovering from the injury and then their mindset is right to get back to work or either go home to their family or whatever they want to do after work. Yeah. We have thrown a lot of terminology out there in the last <laughs> couple of minutes, and we've talked a lot about um, the different tools that, that you guys use, but really what are universally being used, even by people at home, just the pure access that we now have to mach um, compression guns, to compression boots, red light therapy. You can get one of those and put it on your desk in the, during the day. You can put treadmills at your desk as well. You can have standing desks, right? There's, there are all these things, and I think it's pretty overwhelming as a consumer at home and as, as an individual at home how can you begin to understand what tools 
might be best to start with to build your, your toolkit. Um, how does that pertain to maybe the sport you're doing? So if you are a triathlete, for example, I am someone who religiously loves to travel with my compression boots mm -hmm. wherever I go because I know when I get off that airplane, I need to get the inflammation out of my legs. I need to get the blood flow restored back to those legs. Um, in your head, kind of when someone's sitting at home and especially looking at the prices to some of these tools, right? It's, it's not... It, while they're accessible in the sense that you can go online and purchase them, they may not be accessible from a pricing perspective. So for you at home, kind of what are your bare bone necessities of what you like to have when you're home, when you're traveling, what's kind of like your go-to kit? Okay, so my go-to kit is what I'm wearing right now, my compression socks. I love my compression socks, they increase circulation, uh, decrease vibration force, uh, just helps the recovery process. So I wear compression socks, whether they're performance compression socks or recovery, probably every day. Um, so you're on your feet all day long, right? So we want to make sure that we're compressed in that way. So that's definitely a huge go-to for me, especially when traveling airplane, prevent pooling in your legs, compression socks, right? Um, I travel all the time with compression boots, um, a massage gun, um, and then also stim. So those are my favorite. There's tons of research on electric stimulation over the years and what it can do and how it can help you either increase blood flow or fiber recruitment. So there's different ways you can use it. Th those, that's my go-to. So if I could pick one, it'd probably be EMS or neuromuscular electric stimulation. Um, it's probably also the cheapest set of those, uh, besides the compression socks, those are obviously the cheapest. Um, but boots, they can be pretty costly, um, and so can a massage gun. Uh, I know you can find massage guns and different types of boots on Amazon, um, but I, I personally, I, I love the compression boots, right? Um, and you could travel with them, you can bring them everywhere you want and they help you with recovery. So they're gonna basically compress, release, compress, release, increase blood flow, drain your lymphatic system. Some research shows, I believe, an increase in IGF-1 growth factor as well, which helps with muscle repair and tissue repair. A massage gun um, is easy to use. So that's the benefit of a massage gun. You also let the gun do the work, just say that right here. Don't dig in too much. It's just like getting a really aggressive massage or going too hard on the foam roller. You don't wanna beat yourself up but it can help decrease tension in certain areas. So especially because now they make the massage guns a smaller versions of it, you can just throw it right in your bag, right? So if you can get one of those smaller ones, um, with percussion therapy, massage gun, just increasing blood flow, decreasing tension, it's a great thing to travel with. So I would say top four, compression socks, compression boots, massage gun, EMS or stim, uh, great for travel with. Um, and then also your number one recovery tool, no matter number two, ones that you don't have to pay for are sleep, right? You gotta sleep and you have to have good quality sleep. It's not just about laying down. You know, when I started tracking my sleep, I realized I wasn't having good quality sleep. I'm kind of going into something else here, but I actually moved, me and my wife moved apartments um, in our same building here in New York City because we went from an apartment with more windows to an apartment with less windows because I wasn't sleeping well because the sun, like great, cool apartment, you see the city, awesome but I was waking up every day too early when the sun came through. Um, so for us, it was a great way just to create a better sleep environment. Um, we've tried to keep our dog off the bed, Boris, but he weighs 85 pounds and yeah, dude. <laughs> there's so no stopping there's him no stopping days. him, exactly. So he's just in bed, uh, but you know, sleep is free. Make sure you sleep well. Uh, I'll recommend cold, dark, quiet environment. Put your device like in the kitchen or something. Um, buy an alarm clock, do something like that, and then hydrate. If you're not hydrated, not only can it, you know, decrease blood flow and circulation, but if you're not hydrated well, your brain goes haywire, right? And you can't think well, you're gonna be more stressed. Um, and if you're not hydrated, your body's just not gonna recover. So make sure you're hydrating, uh, make sure you're taking enough, that doesn't mean water always, that means electrolytes as well. So hydrate and sleep are free, those are the best recovery tools, and then add those passive modalities in as well. Hydration is a huge topic, and actually I think we have this conversation pretty often, um, just the sodium uh, deficiency that we're now seeing. I think we had this discussion with James Newberry as well, shout out to James, but um, you're always harping in as well. You know, you need to get in that mag magnesium, potassium, and sodium mix as well. It isn't reaching for um, those sport drinks, those classic sport drinks that have a ton of sugar in them. It's not reaching for, you know, uh, those baby formulations as well, mm -hmm. which is you, you typically people's go-to, whether it's a hangover all the way through, maybe I give myself a case of the Toms, right? Um, so what, what, what are the, what's the magic formula here with those big three? Okay, so there's a huge debate on this, um, but the research is showing that if you have too much salt or too little salt, it's 
the same. It can increase cardiovascular disease, everything. There's a sweet spot in the middle, right? So you want to make sure that you are taking in some. Um, a lot of the studies back in the past uh, included like processed foods, things like that, that were high in sodium. So that's what showed people's levels were too high. Uh, but the research shows that if you're too high or too low, it, it's the same thing. It's a negative, right? So there's that sweet spot. So what I like to do, because my diet is pretty clean for the most part, um, I'll add in some sort of salt into whether that's a supplement that has sodium in it or just taking like sea salt flakes. So this is something me and Cameron started doing um, in 2020. We started talking about it and discussing it. Before I went to bed, I would just put sea salt flakes in water and some, put some lemon to help with digestion and then I would just drink it there. So then I get my electrolytes from the sea salt. I'm not overly saturating with too much salt. Um, and I'm just staying in that sweet spot to then use the salt to help hydrate my system itself. So really most people have too little or too much. If your diet's super clean, you're probably too little. If your diet's terrible, you're probably too much. So you can get your your levels your measure your levels measured per se. But there's really a sweet spot. So adding in usually more salt is actually somewhat better, to be honest, um, from what the research is showing. Uh, so just add some salt into it. Add some electrolytes into it. Um, yes, there's some companies like you know that have these drinks that are super high in sugar. There's also a negative aspect of that as well, right? So any added sugar really is not that great for you. Um, so make sure that you're staying clean on that and avoiding that because there is some research that shows it could dehydrate you actually a little bit. Yeah, so we're saying essentially sleep, stress. Um, what was the other one that we said? Sleep, stress. Hydration. Hydration. Those are huge. Yeah. Those, and those are free. Those are all kind of, we call them controllables, right? Those are the things that you can really wake up and, and be determined in the sense that I'm not going to allow myself, I'm not going to allow my stress levels to get too high. I'm going to really focus on getting to bed early tonight and getting a good eight, seven hours of sleep, whatever, whatever it is that you require. I require eight. That's just how I'm programmed. If I get less than eight, I'm slightly off of my game the next day. And then hydration, you know, hydration, drinking all day long. And it's not just about that water. Talk about the actual physiological um, repairing that's happening during your sleep cycle. Talk about how your muscles are physically recovering during that time period. Talk about also um, spacing out workouts appropriately. If I just got, if I just went extremely hard at a Barry's class, eight o'clock on a Monday night, why should I not turn around and run six miles on Tuesday morning? Mm -hmm. So first off, you need to recover. Let's just talk about that, right? So if your body's too stressed, your, let's say your cortisol levels. So when we work out, the body becomes stressed. So if you're taking your blood work right after you work out, it's probably gonna be terrible. Um, your body's way too stressed and your body needs time to repair itself. If we're not repairing ourselves, and then we're going into a workout the next morning, you're literally like going in with a half a tank of gas, right? So your body's just not prepared to go and to move to that position. So you need to recover properly. You need to make sure you take enough time to recover and need to get your sleep. So. Sleep is interesting, and I, I say quality of sleep more than quantity because once I started measuring my sleep, maybe I was in bed for nine hours, but I wasn't sleeping for nine hours, right? There's different stages of sleep. You have light, um, you in deep sleep, right? You don't release your growth factor, your IGF-1, or your hormones that repair our tissue unless you're in that deep sleep stage, so that like medium to deep stage. So we need to make sure that our quality of sleep is good so that we're releasing these hormones to actually repair our tissues. So when you release these hormones, they come in and they, like IGF-1 growth factor, let's say, it helps with protein synthesis, right? It helps to repair the tissue itself and just remodel our tissue. So that's what's happening there. And it's the training effect, right? You, you, when you train, you rip your tissue apart and the tissue comes in and repairs itself and comes back stronger and better, right? So sleep and hydration have a lot to do with that. If you're constantly stressing yourself, you're not allowing those levels to drop and you're staying at a high level of stress. Um, if you stay at a high level of stress, it could create irritation, one. Um, I always say that if you have irritation or too much stress, it leads to your mind being elsewhere, which affects your focus and affects your coordination, which can lead to poor form, um, which can lead to injury, right? So that's a chain reaction that occurs from down Make sure you're taking proper time between each workout. If you're doing a workout at 10 o'clock at night like I do, maybe don't work out the next morning. Maybe wait till the next evening to work out. Um, if you go to that, do that workout and you're super sore and you had a leg day but your legs are crushed, listen to your body. Don't do legs that day. You know, switch the workout up, like switch it up. Because if you overstress your tissue, you're also just 
not allowing that recovery phase to happen. So the tissues just never actually fully recover. I'll call anyone out in this room right now. Uh, oh, hey now. But, when, <laughs> <laughs> but when we looked at programs, you know, I was like, just do less. Sometimes less is more. Don't overstress your tissue. Uh, let your body recover itself. Let your body go through that entire process and phase so that you feel better and then you'll perform better and you'll lift more, you'll be stronger, you'll be faster, but your body needs time to repair itself. So less is more. I tell this to a lot of my athletes as well, is just take a day off. Like sometimes you need that day off. Make sure you're taking at least one day off per week. Sometimes you need two, sometimes you need more, but your body needs to relax and repair and recover in order to optimize your performance on the next workout. Especially as you get older. You know, we're not 22 years old anymore. I think I told you about one of our athletes. Shout out to Amari out there. I was shooting with him for a bodybuilding.com shoot, and this kid was an absolute jackrabbit with the box jumps that he was pulling off. And I asked him how old he was, and he, yeah, he's in his young 20s. And I was like, wow. Um, <laughs> I felt that for a second. Um, you know, t <laughs> talk about, um, you know, um, the importance of everything that you just said, especially as you get as you get older, you know, when you turn, when you really round that that let's say 30 right when you're around that corner of 30 mm -hmm. 30 isn't old by any means but you also aren't 20 anymore so why does this become increasingly more important as you as you age our body just doesn't repair itself as fast as it did right uh, i'm 37 and man i'm sore after workouts or like i played basketball i was telling you i played basketball the other day and i'm not sore i got some kid just ran into me and my calf is sore like I feel bruised right and I think about that when I played football and I was younger I wrestled I just get beat up every day and never feel this sore so it's just our body going through a process as we age right and that's why we're doing everything we can to improve our lifespan and longevity and we're using all these other outside tools and such to help that process occur so that our bodies. Let's talk about a couple other factors that can have a high impact on recovery. So firstly, let's go into alcohol intake. So we're actually seeing a huge wave right now with a younger demographic. They are opting out of alcohol use um, just based off of the knowledge that we're now seeing devices such as a lot of these wearables that we're wearing right now that can really measure um, your daily habits and your daily behaviors and then show you as a result what you did the day before, how that impacted you for the next day. Talk about um, alcohol um, impact on the physical recovery of a body. Okay, so it's bad. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. Uh, I stopped drinking. I wasn't a big drinker, but I would drink with my buddies on Sunday um, while watching football or whatever, playing golf. Uh, and I stopped drinking about six and a half years ago, and I feel so much better. Okay. Um, I stopped drinking because the next day I would notice that my mental state as a, at that point, an entrepreneur uh, was just delayed. My processing time for my brain was delayed and I wasn't fully there. I wasn't showing up the way that I should be until like midday the next day. And I wasn't drinking a lot, I would only have like a couple of beers, but that was it, but my body really did not react well to it. So the issue with alcohol intake is it could affect your immune system and your recovery process from all different ways. Basically what happens is that when you drink alcohol, your body has to process everything that's in there, whether it's sugars, everything that's inside of that alcohol, all the alcohols, things like that. So your body's processing that. So when you go to sleep, your body actually doesn't get into that full deep sleep. And that's why all these wearables show that you had poor sleep. Like you think you're in bed for 10 hours or you think, quote unquote, you pass out. No, you don't pass out. Your body is up working to process all that alcohol you just took in. So it affects your sleep. And if you affect your sleep, it affects your recovery. Like we said, we don't get into deep sleep, our body doesn't release proper hormones and growth factors, and our muscles don't repair ourselves, right? Also, a big issue with alcohol is it can re react with your coordination, your reaction time, and your mental state. So if you're recovering from alcohol a day of drinking and the next day you go to work out, your reaction time is gonna be lower, your coordination is gonna be poor, your focus is gonna be less. So those are all the things that prevent injury is being hyper-focused, be coordinated, and really your reaction time being there. So there's a chain reaction that occurs from drinking alcohol. So your body's not recovering. Uh, there's also a lot of research that shows that alcohol can impair your immune system. So it could lead to more stress on your immune system. So you'll be more susceptible to being sick per se as well. And if you get sick, you don't recover. So it's just like a full circle, right? If you're not, if you're drinking, you're not sleeping well, um, it also dehydrates you. That's another huge thing is alcohol does dehydrate you. So if you're not hydrated, your tissues aren't properly fueled or hydrated. Um, your joints, you know, have less circulation um, and everything is basically impaired. Um, so alcohol is a big no-no. Um, if you're a serious athlete, you know, some people are like, oh, stop or lower your alcohol intake. To be quite frank, uh, just don't drink. 
you know, there's all non-alcoholic beverages uh, that people can have now if you want that taste of beer or such. Um, there's non-alcoholic wines. I saw recently that Rockefeller Center is a store there, non- a non-alcoholic alcohol, right? Uh, <laughs> is that? So, and I, I tasted one of the wines and, you know, it tasted like wine to me. So maybe real wine drinkers would argue, but I'm not a big wine drinker or never was. Don't, so. don't come at us in the comments. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'm to, sorry, to, guys. To each, to each yeah. around here. <laughs> so just, just limit it if you can. I would say don't, if you're a serious athlete, don't drink. Uh, it will really improve your recovery times because it's not affecting those other aspects of recovery. So your tissues are staying at an optimal state and your body's allowed to perform the way it should in your recovery process as opposed to impairing it. That's basically what you're doing. You're just impairing your process every time you drink. And also, you know, there's research that shows it kind of destroys your DNA a little bit as well. So I'm sure alcohol, this could probably be tons of new research coming out in the future because we're doing a lot of research on it now because non-alcoholic drinks are becoming so uh, popular, is that it probably also affects your lifespan um, and your longevity. So, you know, limit your alcohol intake or say no to it if you can, um, and rather hydrate your system and properly fuel your system. Yeah. Awesome. Now we're not here to talk necessarily about nutrition. Obviously, we don't have a, a dietitian in, in the house here, but we are talking about the impact of the human body and, and how your body is recovering on a daily basis from one of their workouts or just daily life. So, so let's talk about underfueling. Let's talk about underfueling. I just had a massive, massive strength day. Maybe I didn't refuel properly. How is that going to play a role in how my body is is feeling the next day? And continuous cycles of underfueling, how that can also set you up for a higher risk of injury as well. Okay, so it's just vitamins and minerals. Um, if you're not taking the proper vitamins and minerals, like I said, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm a physical therapist. So if you're taking in, not taking the proper vitamins and minerals, your body's not getting the fuel that it needs, right? Um, or if you're taking in the wrong vitamins and minerals, right? So a big thing that I see is that people are like, oh man, I ate a ton of protein after I worked out, but what types of protein did you eat? And they'll say things like, oh, I had a, you know, a fried, chicken sandwich is a lot of protein. Yeah, but you're using fried foods, which can pro- cause more inflammation in your body. One, let's say that's it. The condiments that you put on most of these foods have high sugar, things like that, or not the best um, whole foods per se, that if you can say. So really proper fueling is huge, right? So a big thing is make sure you eat enough as well. A lot of athletes are under fueled, I've realized. Um, I had this conversation with my buddy, uh, Key, uh, last year, two years ago, when he was training off season for the NFL, we were talking a lot about fueling, and it's really just taking in the proper things, right? And people their entire lives can work on athletic ability, and they can eat whatever they want. And there's some athletes that argue, oh, I can have McDonald's. Um, you know, I'm gonna call now Chad Ochocinco over there, but he is one of the greatest athletes of all time. But and his body is that like one percenter that his body re- still reacted well and recovered well. But a lot of people, if you increase inflammation or taking the poor nutrition, your body is going to basically fight against that and it's not going to properly heal, right? Or you're going to increase inflammation in your body, possibly through the use of like fried foods or poor oils, right? That's another thing a lot of people don't get is that when you eat out, a lot of the times restaurants cut costs, right? So they're going to use cheaper oils. These cheaper oils have been shown like canola oil to increase inflammation in your body. So we need pure oils that, you know, sometimes cost a little more, but if you cook at home, that's okay. Get that extra virgin olive oil, things like that. Um, Just be clean. I say whole foods, be clean, get your protein intake after you work out, whether that's through a shake, fuel, or whole foods itself, but just make sure that you're getting proper vitamins and minerals as opposed to what most athletes do is just leave the gym and go grab a beer or something like that. Um, because we want to make sure that you're fueling your body properly so it has the efficient nutrients, vitamins, and minerals to actually repair itself. Great stuff. And we're going to transition into our final topic here, and it's a big one, and it's probably one that has gained a little bit more attention as of recent years, and that's really the mental health impact that injuries can have. And now this isn't just the mental health impact of a professional athlete who's um, you know, living is to play that sport, right? This is everywhere from your, again, I'm going to say it again, your weekend warrior and your everyday gym goers to your amateur athletes all the way to your professional athletes. Whatever disruption that you experience in your daily routine is going to have an impact on your mental health. 
Talk about the patterns that you have historically seen in, 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 in individuals who become injured and whose daily life does become disrupted because of, it, because of an injury. And what is sort of the advice that you, you, you know, give them to take home? Okay, so um, negative reinforcement is bad. Let's put that out there, right? So if you don't think you're going to get better, you're possibly not gonna get better, okay? Your brain is a very strong thing. It will affect your recovery. So if you're saying like, oh, I'm doing bad, I'm not gonna do better, yeah, you're limiting your ability. That's it, performance, right? So negative reinforcement is terrible. If you have negative reinforcement in your life, find a way to get rid of it, okay? I'm just putting that out there. Step one. Step one, get that out, right? So positive reinforcement is huge. You have to tell yourself you're gonna get better. You need to train your brain and your mind to understand that you're going to get better and you're going to do better. You're gonna perform better, right? You need to be positive with yourself and you need to have external factors that are positive. Um, one of the biggest things that I talk about with athletes, especially endurance athletes, um, is Samuel Marcoa's bio psychosocial model of endurance, right? Um, so he's a researcher. Um, I actually gave you that book to read about it. Um, and he talks about this model. His model is saying that there are different types of external factors, whether that's physiologically through our individual selves, you know, we're affected by like a VO2 max test, how much oxygen we can consume, how our bodies can function, how properly we can function. We're also affected by social factors, external factors, support groups, support people, support individuals, right? And then we're also affected by our own psychological aspects. So meaning, are you motivated? Um, are you not motivated? Do you have a lot of stress in your life? Do you have a lot of negative impact in your life? This can all affect one another. So yes, your physiological performance body will affect your performance, but if you're having issues with all these other external factors, they will affect your performance and they will come down to impair your performance in a way, right? So. One of the big things that I like to tell everyone is that you have to practice your mental fitness. If you don't practice your mental fitness, you're not gonna all of a sudden like walk into the gym and be mentally prepared to work out, right? You have to practice this at home, at work, and in the gym, okay? You need to understand that your mental fitness can be affected by all these other external factors, social factors as well. So if you're having a stressful situation at home or a stressful situation at work, you're not gonna be performing at your best when you're in the gym and vice versa, right? So you have to practice positive reinforcement and that's positive self-talk. So it's not just you know external factors of seeing like a nice photo that makes you happy, which research shows that if you flash a smiley face, this is Samuel Marco's research, on a person on a treadmill, they will go longer and stronger on their treadmill runs, right? as opposed to flashing sad faces. Like this actually does affect our brain. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're giving ourselves positive reinforcement and positive self talk, talk throughout this entire process. You need to tell yourself you're gonna be better. You need to believe in yourself. That is a huge thing. If you do not believe in yourself, you're not gonna do as best as you can, right? So that goes kinda into his 60% rule. Um, he was saying that your 60% when your body you know, feels fatigued, some people call this like the Navy SEAL rule, things like that, um, you're actually only 60% you know, done. You still have 40% left in the tank. And your body needs to understand that you're going to get better and you're gonna be able to get past that point. But if you don't train yourself to understand that, it's gonna affect you in a negative aspect or impair your performance or limit your performance in a way. So I think the biggest things that people need to take away from this is that mentally be positive. Practice positive reinforcement in the gym, at home, at work, all the time, because you're gonna be affected by each one of those, and if you're sad or unhappy in one of them, it will affect your performance. So be happy. Um, you can also do meditation work, mindfulness work, um, yoga, you know, breathing techniques, things like that. Or if you're just feeling super stressed when you get to the gym or something you're lifting, sometimes stop what you're doing Take three deep breaths, that's what I always say. Take three deep breaths and go for a walk. Walk around the block one time. Clear your mind. If you can clear your mind, you can get back to the performance you want without these external factors affecting your performance. Our brain is undoubt undoubtedly the most powerful organ in our body, right? Talk about the mind-muscle connection, how that plays a specific role in the injury aspect of of this cycle right so someone just got an acl reconstruction right how do they how does the brain play a part in 
helping someone walk again and helping someone run again, right? How mm-hmm. does the mind play a role in that in that process? So mind body connection, right? You have to connect your brain to the muscle you want to use. That sounds crazy for some people, but it's true, right? So if you're doing, let's use like um, a quad set or a knee extension or something like that, where you where you contract your quadricep muscles, you should actually think about through your brain c- contracting that muscle more that will show that the muscle will contract more. You'll have more activity of that tissue itself. So that mind-body connection is huge. If you're doing your bicep curls and you're you know, a weightlifter or cosmetically trying to have bigger biceps, think about that. Like squeeze your biceps. Think about your mind squeezing the biceps. Yeah, if you flex between sets, there's research that shows it actually can decrease your strength on the next set. But if you're just looking for hypertrophy, squeeze away, right? If you want those biceps to be bigger, connect your brain to it between sets, squeeze as much as you want. You might not be able to lift as much because it'll affect your performance. If you're training for performance, I don't recommend flexing between sets. Disclaimer. Disclaimer, you want to get stronger, don't flex between sets. But if you want to, just connect that brain. But when you're doing the the workout itself, whatever muscle that you want to contract or the muscle that you want to focus on working, connect your brain to that muscle and really try to hyper focus on that muscle contracting itself. And there's research that shows that will help that mind body connection to help that muscle get stronger and grow in itself. Absolutely. So throughout our entire chat, we've talked a lot about longevity. And what we're seeing today is a lot more emphasis on just that when it comes to health and wellness goals. Why are we seeing that shift, right? Why are we seeing people, you know, moving from I'm going to go really hard in my 20s, and then I'm going to kind of dwindle out from there, whereas now, no, I want to keep doing Ironmans until I'm 85, right? So why do you think that's become such a big shift in our culture? Well, first off, we're living longer. Right. Uh, generationally, we're living longer through the use of medical advances and technology um, and the research that we're having and supplements and just medical as a whole is allowing us to live longer. People are living longer. So people's mindsets are shifting to I want to and also people are having children later in life. So people want to be prepared to you know interact with their kids later in life. But we're shifting to that aspect of let's live as bespoke we say live better longer right that is what our that's what we go by that's where we want every patient to be is to live better longer Um, and we'll focus on longevity and lifespan so as we age we want to age more gracefully we want to make sure that we're aging properly so that we can play with the next generation of our family or you know interact with all those people or just in general if you don't have family just exercise longer and be really focused on bettering yourselves and improving this actually all comes through everything we spoke about today. So there's all these different factors that play a role in our lifespan and longevity, whether it's exercise, sleep, nutrition, um, hydration, all these things affect one another. And it's showing us that all of this that we're working on, if we do these properly or work on all these individual things, we should be able to live longer, right? Bottom line, through technology, through research, through the medical advances that we're having right now, is we should be able to live longer, per se. But we want to live more gracefully longer. We want to be able to perform an Ironman when we're 80. You know, that's my goal. Um, And generations before us did not have that, and they weren't living as long, right? Um, But we're also, as a generation, more focused on things like exercise. Exercise as a whole is huge. If you move and you stay moving, not only will it make you stronger, but it'll also increase your blood flow, your circulation, and allow your brain to be better, right? We have to make sure that we're also playing that mental fitness game. We spoke about mental fitness earlier, but we also wanna make sure that we're training our brain, right? Don't let your brain just stop working, especially those that retire early. You wanna make sure that you're still challenging your brain because your brain is like a muscle. We stress it to then let it to strengthen itself and become stronger, so it's not decreasing as we age, right? Think about Alzheimer's, it's a very big issue in our society now, dementia, things like that. We want to make sure that we try to avoid these things and usually through what we know in research, it's exercise. Exercise helps everything. Exercise is the key to longevity, okay? If we can stay exercising exercising and stay moving, our bodies and our brain will be stronger and we should be able to age more gracefully and improve our longevity and lifespan. Awesome. Dr. Dan Giordano, thank you so much for coming to the BBCom podcast. We have an exciting 2023 coming up with you and the Bespoke team. Just really pumped for this conversation to come out for our users. Thank you for having me. I look forward to hearing this and I look forward to working with you guys more. Thanks for tuning in to the BBCom podcast. Stay tuned for more stories along the way. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh.